Well, hello, lovely listeners. It gives me um, a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Taryn McCarthy today. Uh, Taryn is an orthodontist, um, but she also empowers business leaders to redefine success and rediscover happiness. And Taryn also has her own podcast called Business of Happiness. And if you're listening to this um, through audio as opposed to video, She's got a wonderful sign behind her, the business of happiness. <laughs> I've got a sign like that in my lodge at home, but it's for a bar. It's called the Not So So Bar. <laughs> oh, I love it. I yeah. love that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, usually, I'm usually in that, but I'm at my partner's house today. So, um, so, so Taryn is also, she's on a mission to help um, driven entrepreneurs to redefine success. Um, guiding high achieving and ambitious business owners and leaders to rediscover happiness in the pursuit of their dreams. And uh, Taryn is intent on exposing the shame, guilt and overwhelm that leads to anxiety and depression, which plagues our business and healthcare sectors. Love it. Love it, Taryn. Um, that is an amazing mission. So welcome. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. And thank you for the platform of your podcast, because bringing this to light and letting other people know that they're not alone in realizing that as you, as you so beautifully do in all in all your podcast episodes is that there's sometimes this moment of recognition where you just feel like you're not happy. In my sense, that's how I say it is you just realize that you're not happy and there's got to be more to life than this. Absolutely. It's that age old question. And it doesn't just hit a few of us. It's very, very common. Yeah. I mean, I would say it hits everybody at some point in their life, apart from the very, very blessed, I would have said. But, um, well, Taryn, I, we'd love to know more about you. If you can give us some history as to um, how you got into being an orthodontist or dentist, as we call them. Um, and also, you know, how that then expanded into the work that you're now doing as a coach. I'm intrigued. So over to you. Thank you. You know, it actually started with that most beautiful, beautiful part of life when we find something that turns us on, something that lights us up. You know, that spark. It's almost like when you fall in love, <laughs> it's early love. And suddenly the sky is brighter and the birds are singing. Nothing's changed in your life, but your car drives so much better than it did the day before you know when you get that little hit of falling in love with something tapping into a passion that speaks to you and that's what dentistry was to me when I was in my 20s I just fell in love with this opportunity of marrying science and artistry and entrepreneurship and leadership and having impact on people's lives on a daily basis and all of it just sang to my soul and I poured my life into becoming a dentist. So my 20s were just studying, put my nose in a book, persevere, push, push, push. And what I did was I ignored all other aspects of my life. I ignored my health. I ignored my body. I ignored my spiritual side. I ignored relationships. I turned everything off. My other passions, I'm an artist. I love to create artistry in terms of sculpture and poetry and music and I just put all of that aside for a decade in the pursuit of this one single-minded focus and then in my 30s <clears throat> when I finally became a dentist I was very unfulfilled and I thought well what am I doing wrong here and I started looking to other people's algorithms of success and I started shaping what I thought would bring me joy which was more accumulation of things, right? Getting a bigger practice. I went to a residency program to become an orthodontist, which is straightening teeth and beautifying smiles with braces and Invisalign. And I thought, well, that must be it. You know, once again, I got to the point where I was an orthodontist and still I'm happy. And I thought, oh, I know what's missing, a family. <laughs> I've got to become a mom, that must be it. And because I'd ignored my body for so long infertility was a big problem for us and that's very common with highly driven single-minded focused success driven men and women who push aside their health for a long time and so we finally got pregnant i finally very quickly my body figured it out after we hit the nail on the head and so i had a couple of kids 
Yeah. And I was just compounding the problem because I was losing myself more and more. And there was this moment, and you talk about this on your podcast. There was this moment where I had everything. I finally had my own orthodontic practice. I had a beautiful mansion in the suburbs. I had family, kids, beautiful kids, handsome husband, the fancy dog even. And I literally had created and manifested what I thought would bring me inner fulfillment and joy and everything, everything, everything. And there is a, you know, this is an embarrassing moment and, I, and I'll share it with you because I think so many of us have these moments that are difficult to share, but here I was an orthodontist doctor and I woke up in a moment of clarity when I literally was hovering over a trash can in my kitchen, peeing, urinating into a trash can. What had happened was I had gotten onto a train of stress and overwhelm to just keep all of these glasses and plates afloat to maintain this house of cards. And I was, co I was compensating every evening by drinking. I was trying to escape the stress and overwhelm and I was using that as my vice. And it wasn't a lot, but it was very consistent. And it was obviously enough to put me in a place where I was urinating in a trash can. And I had patients the next morning at 8 a.m. I had my toddlers in bed asleep down the hall. And I had this moment of clarity. And my husband, my handsome, gorgeous, incredible husband sitting on the couch right there I had this moment where I thought, oh my God, what am I doing? And I quickly rushed in embarrassment to the bathroom and I looked in the mirror and I didn't recognize the woman looking back at me. And it was that moment where I realized I've created this whole world. I put into place everything in my life and I'm terrified. And that's where that guilt and shame started setting in. And I started thinking, oh my gosh, I was just following my dreams. I was just doing what I thought was the right thing to do. And now I have everything in my world that I could possibly ask for. And I'm miserable. What is wrong with me? Mm. And if I could create businesses and I could transform smiles and I could make babies, create life, why can't I make myself happy? And that was that moment. And Really, that started a journey for me of running away, which was my go-to. I just started to run. I sold my practice. I ran from the state. If I could have left my marriage, I tried. I, if I could have left my kids, I might have. I was so terrified. And I felt like I just couldn't do it. I saw other people doing it. And I thought, oh my God, I'm not capable of doing this. And it really um, took a lot of personal attention, personal development, kind of relearning, undoing old belief systems that I had ingrained in me, stripping down what I had thought was success and reinventing myself and understanding what was important to me. And here's the fascinating thing. I'm sitting in front of you. I'm still an orthodontist. Mm. I have a brand new practice. I treat my patients clinically very similarly. I have a team of women who rely on me miraculously for their income, an amazing group of professional women. I'm married to the same incredible man. I have the same kids and everything in my world changed, everything. And what it really took was this moment of clarity. I have stopped drinking. <laughs> for me, sobriety was a big part of, of that. For me, coming to terms with my sobriety was a very important step, but it wasn't the magic key. It doesn't mean that everyone has to stop drinking to find happiness, not at all. But it was an honest reflection with myself and what's important to me, and then giving myself permission to follow that dream. So in terms of the embarrassing story in the kitchen, was that just simply you were very drunk and didn't really know what you were doing or? I think I was living outside of my consciousness. Right. 
think that what you just said, I didn't know what I was doing, was not secondary to the alcohol. I no. think I was doing that in life. Yeah. I think I was just living life day to day, not really present to what I was doing. I hadn't, I couldn't drink that much, <laughs> uh, you know, to black out. I think yeah. I just had a moment of clarity where I realized I'm not even present in my actions. Yeah, I mean, certainly um, around me, there's there's a lot of, I'm hearing a lot more that people are stopping drinking and, you know, it, it can only make you feel better and it makes people feel better. Um, and I've actually got a friend who has really recently been suffering with the alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, bless her, you know, she's going through all sorts of things right now. When did you decide that the drink had to go? It's a really good question. I tried to stop drinking for about five years. Yeah. And I say that, I mean, I tried everything, every way possible. When I, when I say I was drinking, I wasn't drinking all day. Mm. Definitely was only having alcohol at night to wind down. Yeah. And it really was probably a glass, two glasses of wine. So I wasn't, and, and let me be fair, a martini on Friday nights, maybe two. Um, but it wasn't something that I was telling myself painted a picture of a typical alcoholic. You know, yeah. I had this idea in my mind of what someone who had lost control to alcohol looked like. And yeah. I didn't get that picture. And once again, here's that same story. We think outside of ourselves to look for the answers. So I wanted someone to tell me, is this what an alcoholic is? I mean, I remember looking up hundreds and hundreds of DSM, uh, trying to find out what is an alcoholic? What is the definition of an alcoholic? Do I fit that? But the fact that I was even asking myself that question should have led me to an understanding of what is true for me. Mm. And so those five years, people kept saying to me, no, why don't you just drink on the weekends? Or why don't you just have a glass with your girlfriends? And every time I tried to force something that wasn't true to me, I came up failing. And so I tried. I tried to only have alcohol on the weekends, or I tried to the consumption of my thoughts was so invasive that it was actually distracting me from being present in the moment. And so that realization was the truth for me. You know, I realized that somebody else's tolerance was not mine. Many, many of my friends do so well just having a glass of wine on the evening, in every evening. And that doesn't, doesn't interrupt their life. For me, it was a obvious escape and coping of stress that I wasn't facing. So it wasn't alcohol's fault. No. It was, it was my escape. So it took you five years and then you just got to a point where you were like, I've just got to stop. So the way I did, <clears throat> I actually um, started studying neuro-linguistic programming. And one of the aspects of neuro-linguistic programming um, that I really attached for this resolution was facing the truth of the situation face on. So for me, tapping into what drinking meant to me, not to anybody else. So forget that system of what defines an alcohol, an alcoholic. For me, what was it, what was it impacting in my life? And I realized a very, very painful aspect. And for me, what that was, was I was escaping into alcohol at night, even one glass. But what that meant was I wasn't present for my children or my family. So I'd usher them to bed as quickly as possible so I could just relax. And then I'd wake up in the morning overwhelmed with guilt for not having been present with my daughter the night before and asking a four-year-old to put herself to sleep. These kinds of thought processes are what were eating away at me. It wasn't the alcohol. It was the guilt and shame around it that was eating me alive. Mm. And I realized that that's the tool I was using. And then I projected it for myself into the future. What would happen if I didn't stop? How could this play out? And one of the pain points I realized was I was teaching my children that this is what success looks like. Mm. You go to work all day long 
slave your body and your emotions and your mind to your job. You come home and you escape into alcohol and you ignore your family. And that's what I was teaching. This is how you cope with being a business owner. Mm. And that really touched me and hurt me deeply. And I thought, I've got to teach my daughter a different way. I have to to show her that there's a way that you can live a life of your dreams and thrive and create. And that passion I was talking about that I tapped into in my 20s, I didn't want to lose that. I didn't mm. want to just push it aside. I wanted to embody that and live that, that excitement of bringing those things together. But I wanted to honor the joy of it and not the pain of it and use an escape tool like alcohol to just compensate for it. So was this all sort of self-awareness, self-driven, self-development, because you went from being, you know, wanting to run away from your business and, and everything else to still being in that business now. And, and obviously you've become a coach. And um, what did that look like between the wanting to run away and now where you are? What was the transition there? So there was actually another impactful moment in my life, and that was um, my brother's passing. So in 2016, my brother actually took his life. And at the time, absolutely devastating, absolutely an enormous loss and, and an enormously difficult um, event to process. Mm. And a, a, wrapped around it was once again those same words that are going to come up again shame and guilt um a lot of guilt around my brother's passing and what i did was the the interesting gift that came out of it was a little whisper again that life is short you have dreams and i thought i've got to follow these dreams again so at the time i had stepped away from dentistry at least clinical dentistry and i was teaching and i thought that i couldn't run a business i told myself all these stories of my lack and my inability to follow my dreams. And when Douglas passed, I gave myself permission again to try. And I thought, well, what do I have to lose? Now I've done it the worst way possible. So I thought, I'm going to do this my way. So I built my business model on a lot of introspection, which sounds crazy when you first hear it. But I thought, I want to build a business in a different way and base it on my values. So not somebody else's description of an orthodontic practice, not somebody else's description of what success looks like, but what would that look like to me? And so it actually started with a lot of introspection of what, how I want my life to look, how I want my impact to be on my patients and on my community and how I want every day to look. And that was the real important part because I realized that my brother on a daily basis wasn't happy. And how many of us do that? We put off our happiness for the weekend. We have this saying in America of hump day. I don't know if you guys have a hump day. Well, yeah, I know what it is, but yeah, we um, don't have it, yeah. This idea of you're almost there, it's Wednesday, yeah. hump day, you gotta get over the hump, just make it through the week to the weekend. And I thought, I'd never want to live my life where five days a week I'm sacrificing just to get to those two. Mm. In fact, what I noticed among my colleagues was Sunday, the, they call it the Sunday scaries over here. Sunday starts getting shorter and shorter because the afternoon gets robbed by fear and anxiety over Monday morning. Mm. So here are these incredible men and women, my colleagues in dentistry, who are literally putting smiles on children's faces on a daily basis, providing whole incomes for teams of men and women, and during COVID supporting and maintaining and keeping health insurance alive for these men and women when we had to close down our practices, doing incredible things in communities, yet completely bereft of happiness themselves. And I thought there has to be a better way. There has to be a way of going into work on a daily basis and getting that inner fulfillment in the work that you do. That was what my 20 year old self wished for. She imagined, oh my gosh, I'm going to be so fulfilled bringing these beautiful talents together. That's what she dreamt of. And I thought, I've got to make that happen. 
And I did. I figured out how to make that happen. And it's not a secret that I can give to anyone. The secret was within me. And that's what I really believe. I believe that where so many of us have made a mistake is we've looked outside of ourselves for the answer to happiness and success. We've looked to others and said, what she's doing is what I have to do because that's how I'm gonna find happiness. And the truth is it lies within us. So my business model looks nothing like what the gurus in the dental world say it should. But I'll tell you every day I focus on the joy that it brings me so that when I come home at night, I'm not escaping into alcohol, food, Netflix, whatever that escape might be. And I'm fully present and filled to be present with my children at night. So for the benefit of the listeners, how, how long did that take you to go from being rock bottom pretty much to, to self teaching what works for you? Because it sounds amazing but a lot of people will be like well what, what what is that what does that look like you know how you know if somebody's listening right now and they're on you know and they're feeling at the bottom of of their life right now and they're like well I need you know how the hell can I go from feeling like this to feeling happy again just just give us a couple of things that you sort of did you know tangible things that that made a difference for you so I think it would be different for everyone but yeah. for me what really worked for me was drowning out the noise and finding time on a daily basis to be quiet and present with myself. So I think one of the big distractors for us is the cell phones yeah. <laughs> and the connectivity that we have and the noise and the fear that is constantly ruminating all around us in terms of social media and news. And, you know, we, we live in this world of constant anxiety you know there's always a stressor on us whether it's omicron or <laughs> the um in industrial concerns or the economy or even the weather you know we can create these monsters and they're they're actually swimming around us all the time and i realized i personally just had to find time every day to get outside of the noise and that also meant outside of babies and you know yeah. family issues that I needed time to honor just for myself. So I actually got into a meditation practice that didn't look like meditation at first, but I realized that that's what it was. For me, I was a runner. I am a runner. And so running started as my, that, that started my meditation was just quiet, monotonous movement outside, but alone with myself and not entertaining any of the outside stimulation noise. And then, you know, as I gave myself permission to do that on a daily basis, I would ask myself questions that I had been asking other people. So Taryn, what makes you happy? And it's so fascinating because when I ask incredibly accomplished people that question now, I often get a blank stare. Mm. I often get, I don't know what makes me happy anymore. I know what should make me happy, you know, or time with my family, you know, like they're these standard. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the question is really what lights you up? So I talk about these three P's. The first, and there are really three permissions. And the first permission is the permission to dream. And so going back to that 20 year old self, that high in the sky dreamer, I think that's what keeps us alive. I think that, that that promise of something wonderful and beautiful, that drive to see the beauty in life and opportunity and giving ourselves the permission to, be, to grow, even when we're 40, 50, 60, 70, yeah. the opportunity to dream. And I think there comes a time in life where we stop dreaming or we settle. We think, well, this is the lot life has given me. This is the bed I made. I might as well sleep in it. We just settle for what is. And it makes us very complacent. So I think that permission to dream is so important. And then the second key is the permission to honor your own values. So not someone else's values. And, and that's another question when I ask people, well, what are your values? Everyone has high values. There's not one person who won't say, I don't have high values. But what are they? 
And the more I started looking at my values, I realized some of them were uncomfortable because of stories I had told myself. So I'll give you an example of this. Family matters enormously to me. My children are such an important part of my life. I learn so much. They are my greatest teachers. Oh, yeah. Incredibly so. Mm -hmm. And yet, one of my values was creating growth. And that meant in, bus in the business sector. It meant in my office. It meant being at work for several hours a day. It meant there was going to be a moment where my daughter was going to be tugging at my pant leg saying, please don't go. And I had to come to terms with that really deep value of mine, which is growth and creation, and give myself permission to follow that. Give myself permission to tell my daughter, I'm going to be back, sweetheart. I'm going to be back. I'm coming home in a few hours, but this is what lights mommy up. And this is how you're going to do it one day. You're going to give yourself permission to follow your dreams. And that's that third P is the permission to pursue your dreams. And sometimes we tell ourselves, well, in order to be a good mom, I've got to sacrifice this. I've got to limit this. And what we're doing is denying ourselves of that opportunity to follow our passions. And it doesn't mean I love her any less or that she's less of my value. It's just honoring what lights me up. Mm. And I think so often we put those things aside or we think a bubble bath should do it or this idea of self-care, you know, I'll take a weekend a year with the girls, <laughs> you know, and we think that that's fulfilling us, but we're denying ourselves along the way. And the only way we can answer that question is to ask it of ourselves. And it does require for me a moment of daily presence with myself and just asking myself that question and, and giving myself permission to hear the answer. That's amazing, uh, especially the last bit you talked about, you know, giving yourself permission to pursue your dreams because um, so many women uh, feel selfish for doing that, you know, and, and I was one, you know, I, I've worked all, most of my, you know, life. I had my son, he's 22 now, and um, I just constantly felt guilty, you know, the whole time I was out at work and um, guilt, 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 racing here, racing there. And thinking, you know, and I did get to a point actually where I did go part time to spend more time, you know, because the guilt was getting too much for me, I think. Um, and I really enjoyed that. I had more time to be present. Um, but you've got to you've got to work with. But I was still doing other things. You know, I was trying to pursue other things outside. Um, I've always tried to do other things, trying to get out of the rat race or whatever. And um but yeah, I remember those feelings. And I know that a lot of mothers feel exactly the same. And it's it's so hard because I think society drives that. You know, you we wanted it all and we've got it all and we're bloody miserable. <laughs> and we're feeling guilt and we're feeling this and we're feeling that. But actually, you know, if you want to go and pursue your dreams, it doesn't make you a bad mother. It makes you a great mother because that child is learning from your example. Absolutely. That's beautifully said. And you touched on something that's so important. And that is, we wanted it all. We've got it all. Now we're miserable. Yeah. What's interesting is, did you really want it all? And is it all what you want? Yeah. So a great metaphor for this is what I see in the dental world is I'm talking about extremely successful men and women, multi-millionaires, men and women who have the boat, the second home, the maybe airplane, and they have it all, but they don't, in order to maintain that, obviously they have to make money. So they're going to work excessive number of hours to the point where they're not even able to go and sit on that boat. Mm. So they have the boat, but they're not sitting on the boat. Yeah. In fact, when they sit on the boat, they're feeling so guilty about sitting on the boat that it's not enjoyable. So once again, we wanted it all. I believe we can have it all, but is what is the all you want? Or is it something that someone else told you you should have? So if someone said you have to be a mom and a full, uh, you know, full 
business owner and something on the side and a lover and, 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 and we think, yeah, those all sound great. Well, would that all be great for you? And then I come back to that daily, what do you want in your day? Do you really want that boat? Because the boat does cost a certain amount of money. You do have to work a certain number of hours for it. Is that what you want? You know, or is it just what someone else has told you you should want? Mm. It, it's really interesting. And, you know, I've found that for myself as well. The, the more I ask myself the questions, the less I actually want. Yeah. You know, and I find out that, yes, this business and growing this business is so important to me, but not to the point where I sacrifice myself. So there's a place and time where I say, okay, that's plenty. But it also takes being present at that business. So here's an example of how it affects happiness. You know, imagine a mom, since we're talking about moms, who has that little girl tugging at her pant leg in the morning as she's going off to work. And she's leaving her daughter and she's driving to work thinking, oh, this is so terrible. I hate that I have to leave her. I am so resentful of having to be at work on time. You know, these patients are calling me and it's so frustrating. They have such high expectations of me. Don't they realize I'm a mom? I'm a mom. I get to work and I think, okay, in order to feel better about this, so I don't feel so guilty, I'm gonna squeeze in 110 to-dos. I'm gonna make this day really worth it. I'm gonna do twice as much as I should have on a normal Monday because I'm feeling so bad about it. And then I'll feel better. And so we work ourselves through the day, do it multitasking and squeezing in extra assignments, maybe even working through lunch, which is very common in my world. So just trying to do more so that we feel better about the decision we made when we left that home. The afternoon, we're exhausted. In fact, many people in my profession and maybe many of your listeners ignore needing to pee. <laughs> if anybody knows that feeling of you realize suddenly you're so full, you haven't even paid attention all day that you're about to burst. You have yeah. ignored that feeling or, they, or we don't eat, we don't take a moment in the middle of the day to step outside. And so how could we possibly have been present for any moment during that day? And now you're driving to work exhausted. You're depleted, exhausted, frustrated because that list of to-dos you never accomplished. You overestimated how much you could do in a day. And now I get to home and my kids tugging at me. I've had people tugging at me all day. I, I don't have room for it anymore. In orthodontics, I've been on stage all day performing for every patient and appeasing every patient. I can't, I have nothing left in me. So of course, I'm now going to just do the very least to just get through the evening that my bed is calling my name. And then I start the whole thing all over again because tomorrow morning I'm feeling so bad. And when my daughter tugs on my pant leg, I'm remembering last night when I didn't give her the time mm. that she she was asking for. And so the permission to enjoy and to give yourself fulfillment in your work is so critical for us to be able to enjoy and give ourselves permission to enjoy our lives, our personal lives. To me, they are very in, intimately integrated. That if we can't be present in work, how can we be present at home? If we're just practicing for eight hours a day, how to just survive and push aside our own emotions, push aside our own presence to the moment, then we're not learning how to be present even when we're at home and we can't sit on that boat. So I do believe we can have everything. My question is, what is the everything you want? Yeah. Do you want that? But And once again, it's not someone else's um, responsibility to design that perfect life for you. It's only within ourselves and the answers are only within us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I think a lot of people still don't understand that, you know, because they are sort of in that hamster wheel, if you like, and not giving themselves any space to step out of that to and, you know, to even feel what that might feel like, you know. And, and so how did you then go in? So you know, you, you fell back in love with being an orthodontist and you stopped drinking to be more present. And 
you give yourself permission to do many things which enriches you how did you then um get into the business of happiness and the coaching side of things like as if you weren't busy enough (laughs) (laughs) and trust me I am I'm teaching myself every day and reminding myself every day but you know what I realized that I love is this (laughs) I love quality time it's one of my love languages it's why I love patient care it's why I wasn't fulfilling enough to just teach Mm. It was, I needed that one-on-one quality time with my patients. But when I tapped into how much that meant to me, I was able to be present at work. Do you know what I'm saying? So suddenly when I looked at a day of 60 patients, it wasn't overwhelming. It was abundant because I had 60 opportunities to connect with my patients. And even if it's for 30 seconds, it's so fulfilling if you give it the value in the moment. But it does take that presence in the moment. It's a practice, you know, it's very easy to get distracted. So that's what led me to coaching was being able to support my colleagues on learning this technique and all the techniques of presence, being present in the moment and then tapping to your own tapping into your own intuition. And then I thought because I needed to be able to reach more people, I saw this opportunity for other leaders to share this with their teams and with their families. And that's where the podcast came about, is making it more uh, available to as many people as possible. And, you know, once again, I think as business leaders, we have such an enormous opportunity to influence and to change the landscape of success in our communities and so sharing it on the podcast and seeing how other people are doing it in different arenas in all different professions how they're finding happiness in a western society in a very commercial society in this place where materialism is king how do you find focus and happiness in 2022 (laughs) and and be a woman who wants it all and can find joy and happiness in trying to achieve that yeah so the people that are on your podcast they are fellow colleagues or business leaders is it always in the same work or is it business leaders across the board across the board yeah Yeah. it's been fascinating as as i i'm sure you have just enjoyed this journey too it's so amazing to have the opportunity to talk to people in all different arenas oh yeah so even you know even stay-at-home moms struggle with this so even leaders of their families you know and and that's another thing that i've that i've come to understand is that we are all leaders whether you think of yourself that way or not you are a leader of whether it's your team your community or your family or even just of your own dreams but taking that ownership and accountability for your own happiness is such an important part of this Mm. because sometimes we live as victims. We see ourselves as victims of our circumstances, of our genetics, of our environment, of our financial situation. And being able to see yourself as a leader and having some, I don't love the word control, but having some um, ownership of Mm. your actions is so important in order to be able to find happiness definitely um yeah that ownership and that responsibility um can turn a victim into you know an empowered person because if you blame everybody and everything for your demise you're never gonna you're never gonna grow as a person and you're always going to be unhappy it never it will never change um i was having a conversation last night with my partner about that, you know, all of these things that have been uh, sent to try him, shall we say, in the last few weeks, uh, so a few days. And I'm saying to him, I get it, but you know, it's how we react to those things, you know, and at the moment you can't control that. You're just gonna have to see how it plays out and you can't control that either. So, you know, and it's, it's easier said than done because I've done it myself, you know, you get really annoyed with certain circumstances and you know, you, you get yourself in a big tied up knot and you want to scream. 
Um, and then you think, oh, Jesus Christ, what am I doing? You know, because the only person I'm hurting is me. And isn't that it? That's exactly it. Yeah. The only person that ends up being hurt is you. And I love I love that you rent, you brought this up because you do sometimes get stuck when you're in the emotions of it. Yeah. When so wrapped up in the emotions around the circumstance. And it, isn't it so easy when a friend tells you the same story and you see it so clearly? <laughs> you can see exactly how you could help her out. That's why I love coaching so much because we sometimes just need someone outside of the emotions out of us, out of what we're in, to just see it from a 50,000 foot advantage and see it a little bit clearly because the emotions do get us wrapped in old stories old belief systems that we have and it and we feel trapped in our options or in our actions but really there is so much that we can do we do have so many options in every moment so so what does um given the fact that you are now being more present than ever before do you have right okay 2022 is going to look like this or okay. you know do you have anything like that now or are you just sort of living in the moment no I have huge dreams <laughs> <laughs> I love it I mean dreaming is what keeps me feeling alive for me that's one of my biggest values is dreaming I always say that someone asked me once about happiness and for me happiness really is so much gratitude and contentment with what I have but so much excitement for even more. Mm. I just I want to see more. I want to do more. I want to reach more. I, and I don't have, I know I'll be happy even if I don't fulfill those dreams, <laughs> but I have so much excitement for it. You know, if everything were to freeze right now, I am in absolute heaven. I'm so grateful for everything I have in my life. I really am but that doesn't stop me from dreaming. I have huge plans for my businesses. I have huge plans for retreat centers I wanna open up and books I wanna write. And you know, when I think about those things, so, so to go back to an earlier question you had was, how do I know what to do? That sounds phenomenal. How do I get there? Tapping into how it feels when you have a dream and getting back to that feeling. You know, I think we've numbed ourselves for so many decades and, and I'm mm -hmm. speaking as a 40 something, 44 year old woman here, but for decades I practiced putting aside my feelings, putting mm. aside my emotions. And the more I practice that, the more of actually paying attention to my emotions, the more I begin to see what does light me up. So I know that feeling now when I think, oh, maybe I'd like to write a book. I know if that gets me excited or if that's what someone else expects of me in this arena. Yeah and that's, you should write a book, you know? And then I know that feeling now because I've really practiced being present with myself. So when I think, oh, I wanna take my dental practice and move it to a new building and I wanna own the building. I know when I get excited about that, that means that's a path I should follow. Not because I'm some magician of business and I know business better than anybody else and I have an intuitive, it's because it'll bring me so much joy that I know I'll put attention to it and that I'll enjoy the journey. And if it fails, I'll pick it up and I'll figure out a new way because I'm lit up by that process. I know that that's what makes me so happy, not because of the intended outcome or the success that it's going to promise, but because the journey of it is so exciting to me, the creation of it. Amazing. Amazing. Um, how, if people want to know more about you, um, Taryn, how can they find you? Oh, thank you for asking. I'm at the Business of Happiness podcast. That's the <laughs> best way. <laughs> and I have a website, The Biz of Happiness, and I'm on social media as The Business of Happiness. And I have a private Facebook group called The Business of Happiness Hive, which is a great resource for like-minded mostly business owners, business leaders, to yeah. be finding and supporting one another and finding happiness and inner fulfillment in this phenomenal world of business. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. Um, it's been a real 
uplifting pleasure to talk to you actually um you're a very smiley person for the people that are just <laughs> listening to this there's a <laughs> smile just all the time <laughs> i'll tell you it's my go-to life is good and i have to say this has been such a pleasure chatting with you i i really appreciate your presence it's been very apparent to me how you really are such a great listener. I really enjoy being in the in the space with you. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I always like to leave these episodes with some pearls of wisdom or anything you feel called to share to the listeners. Anything you'd like to say? I think I'd say that you have all the answers within yourself. Perfect. That's it. Yeah, and it, it is so true. Um, and we doubt ourselves all the time, um, especially that old, you know, intuition, that good instinct. We put it to one side, don't we? Um, and we shouldn't. But I, I love the fact, because I was thinking when you were talking about if it excites me, then it's what I should, it's what I want to do, not I should want to do. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna implement that because that makes an, a lot of sense. So uh, thank you, Taryn. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Happy holidays, and thank yeah. you once again for the opportunity. It's so fabulous to connect. Absolutely. Thank you.